What's up, everybody? I wanted to come to you today from the very first place I did my first law video from. Now, I'm doing my very first podcast video from this exact same location. Now, the great thing about this is the fact that today we get to go on kind of a run-on topic, which means we're going to leave a little bit of what's on YouTube on YouTube. And what we're going to bring here is more of a conversational or discussion type piece where I'm allowed to kind of go off topic because the things that I do for the first series of YouTube police stops, I don't want to veer off from that. This podcast allows me to go on to other subjects, not really getting too deep into them, but bringing them up, bringing them to your awareness, as well as dropping a little bit of information. And on here, unlike YouTube, I will give some opinion. I will also follow it up with me saying, this is my opinion. So you don't have to worry about saying, hey, I couldn't find that. Or that did that didn't make any sense. It's my opinion. But the law is real, just like on my other series. And the channel itself is going to be expanded. And as well, for the podcast, you can also donate. So let's get into it. And the first one, I'm excited. Let go. The beautiful part about today is the fact that the day's podcast, the, not a series, it is called Supreme Decisions Leveling the Playing Field. And the reason why it's called that is because that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm helping the common man and woman have not only finding access to actual legal knowledge, but I'm presenting it in a way that is very simple, easy to learn, and easy to grasp. And today I was trying to figure out exactly what I was going to speak about. And I was able to come across a movie that brought something to my attention, as well as I had a question posed to me on Facebook. And the question was regarding... Should an innocent person plea to get out of jail? And I was also sent something by the ACLU regarding bail reform. Here are my thoughts. The movie in question is Roman J. Esquire. In the movie, Denzel Washington plays an attorney that has a profound grasp of the legal system and one of his choices is to just research and not really be a part of it because he did not want to be a part of what he called the waste of the system itself. He spoke about the legal system has very little to do with law now because it is a volume business. Everything that's being done is regarded to be done for money down to the plea bargains themselves and the prisons that house inmates are now becoming less state run or government run and are privately ran and you have people going to prison for long term for victimless or non-crimes and the one thing about this that really caught my attention was the fact that he spoke about if our constitution grants us the right to a fair trial and 95 percent of all cases never are heard by a judge or a jury are we really exercising our right to a trial let alone a fair trial 
astonishing things about this is the fact that when you get down and you look at it, how we're building more jails than we are schools, and how whenever you look at an inmate that's on death row, two out of every three inmates are being released not because of a glitch in the system, but it's because people that are in things like the Innocence Project, where the Innocence Project, they focus on attempting to get a conviction overturned based off of eyewitness testimony or eyewitness encounters. And a lot of times we're having things such as cross-race identifications that are highly suggestive or highly inaccurate. And we're talking about in the range of 80 plus percent. And what that leaves us is, aside from the eyewitness testimony, you have two out of every three inmates being released because of DNA evidence. Because they're being found that they could not have committed that crime. And when you start looking at a system that is incarcerating almost 25% of its citizens, at some point, you have to ask yourself, is it the system? Or do we all live in a place where one out of every four pe person is a bad person? And unfortunately, we live in a time where that question is being asked far too much because we're being programmed to believe that everyone around you is bad. And guess what? If you believe everyone around you is bad, the person standing next to you believes everyone around them is bad as well. And what that does, it creates an area for distrust. It creates an area for chaos. And here is some of the things that I know we need to get into. And the first thing I want to start off with is ACLU and their bail reform. I'm going to say pretty much how bail is orchestrated now, why, and a few cases to kind of throw in there. The reason bail reform is being sought is because you're looking at certain instances, and one of those is Tate v. Short, 1971, 401 U.S. 395. It is a denial of equal protection to impose only a fine for those who are able to pay it, but to convert the fine to imprisonment for those who are not. And Williams v. Illinois, 1970, 399 U.S. 235, and Morris v. Schoenfeld, I probably mispronounced that, 1970, 399 U.S. 508, pretty much deal with that exact same thing. Now, here is one of those where we're looking at bail reform. It's also one I'm going to bring up later when we talk about things such as child support. Because when you're talking about, I'm going to restrict your liberty if you can't pay, it becomes a debtor's prison, which is unconstitutional. But here's what we're going to do with that. But again, that's for another podcast. What's happening is you have a lot of folks that will go to, go to jail or go to jail and sit because they're giving a bail and they have no idea what the bail is, why the bail is, or where the number came from. Because whenever you watch a lot of legal shows, you hear the prosecution go up as well as whoever that's appointed for you as counsel. And we're going to go into that as well in another podcast. And they'll discuss a plea bargain or what it's going to cost for you to be released. Well, the things being discussed are... The charge, which I'm going to get into that word later, or the offense, which for the most part is one and the same. 
The second part they're going to discuss is your finances or your ability to pay. Now, the reason why it goes in that order is because they look at your ability to pay versus what they're accusing you of. How severe, because then we go into part three, is the societal interest. Now, if it's murder, if it's a man, expect half a million dollars. You know, they want you to sit. If it's a woman, depending on how gruesome the murder is. Let's say it's something as simple as you went to court, you were fined for a traffic citation. You were unable to pay, and they said, you know what, you got to spend four days in jail. Should you go to jail for a traffic citation? Is that really something that there need to be a discussion about? Or, let's say, shoplifting. And you're shoplifting food or pampers. Should your bail really be $5,000 when you can't pay for $100 worth of groceries? And then it goes into number four, the likelihood of you showing up or your character. And keep in mind, they believe everybody's bad. Now, here's where it gets kind of tricky, especially for a person like myself. Because I don't care what it is. I'm going to court. The judge knows I'm going to court. Prosecutor is hoping I don't come to court. So they're stuck in a conundrum for the most part. Because you have somebody you know that's going to come up, come to court each and every time to fight. They're not going to plea. So holding them really doesn't do a whole lot to discourage them. So what do you do? This is where the system itself falls apart. Because when you hold somebody prior to going to court or being convicted of anything, and I'm also going to get into that, because subjecting someone to punishments similar to that of a felon prior to conviction is a violation. That is not an opinion. You'll know it when I say it. That's what happens because now you're held for XYZ days, you lose your job, you lose your house, in many cases, you lose custody of your kids, and this what what happens is now the family dynamic is torn apart for a, can, a, a country that is family-oriented, who is grounded in the morality of family. We have a system in place that systematically deteriorates the family system. The Bail Reform Act of 1984 the excessive bail clause prohibits judges from requiring excessively high amounts of bail for an accused person to get out of jail before trial. Now, generally, this is something that is not exercised. And, or what they do, because again, the system is designed for breaking up the family and getting money and breaking it for all you got. They'll actually put, even if you request it, they'll generally put it off at least 10 or more days. Because again, the purpose of the system itself is not for punishment. Ask Arnold Schwarzenegger, because whenever he was asked about Tukey Williams and his execution, Arnold Schwarzenegger stated that jail is not for reform. It's for punishment. So if we're not doing something to punish someone, even the innocent, what is it for? So now we have innocent folks, really innocent folks, that have not actually committed a crime, sitting in jail, being torn from their families, losing their job, losing their possessions, because of a flawed system. Or is it flawed? Because the general consensus is, just like I spoke about earlier, murder. We look at U.S. v. Salinor, 481 U.S. 739-1987. Holding a person before trial only if they can prove the person was too dangerous to allow loose in the community. These are generally reserved for those that 
have some type of violent crime such as battery, assault, even armed robbery, or, and of course murder, but not often exercised in those instances. Bail is generally revoked for those that they deem a flight risk. And the reason why you hear that more often than being a terror to the community is because it's easier to make an assumption than it is to prove that they're dangerous. Even with a murder, you have no intentions because now you have to prove in a bail hearing that for the most part, even if it's um, circumstantial, that this person is a murderer and a danger. But because of the charges, which you'll hear often, we think he's a punk and not gonna come to court. Or she's a punk, not going to come to court. Or she's too scared, or he's too scared, not going to come to court. So they're a flight risk. But that's not what the law says. But this is something that's generally accepted. Now, understanding policy, no matter how well accepted, is not law. It's now how you stand up and assert that bail is something that's required. That you are going to be in court. And those things are the easy. My track record has shown I'm coming to court. I don't need a ridiculous high amount of bail. Hey, you can release me on my own recognizance and I will still be there. I look forward to confronting the system. And that's what I look at it as. Not necessarily that everybody in the system is bad. Because there are a lot of people that I say things while in court that have no idea what's being said. And it's not their fault. It's because the more law that's being shielded, it's easier to control, manipulate, and force through policy. Because 90% of people live with policy versus law. Well, understanding today was just a run through. And understanding that there are actions that need to be taking place regarding bail and understanding the system is a money generator, not a legal system. Because as the system gets away from law, the eyes will witness things that are not law, but it will force you to believe something is when it actually isn't. Law is going to be written. Law is going to be something that is unchanging. Law is going to be something that is going to be exact and precise. What we have before us is an opportunity. It is time for us to understand that it's our responsibility to protect us. Whether it's at home, at our jobs, or even in traffic. Hope you enjoyed the first one. Many more to come. Be on the lookout. And also, if you wish to donate, remember, got links in the in the description. <laughs> Next time.